Okay, so I started recording. Okay, yeah. So uh, to um, yeah, so a couple of points here. So okay, so uh, what I thought we could talk about today uh, was first about accessing hummingbird, uh, and then some things uh, that are that you know, some background knowledge that sorry you should have when you're working with systems like Hummingbird. Basically two things, uh, something called a scheduler that helps you run your workloads on such systems. And then some sort of basic idea about uh, what a supercomputing cluster is and how it is, you know, how it's designed and how, what are the different components of a cluster? So first, uh, you know, let's start with this. Uh, if uh, to access Hummingbird or any system as such, uh, so this is the link. Uh, I'll paste it in the chat as well. Um, but yeah, uh, so you need two things to get started on Hummingbird. First is some sort of uh, terminal application. So uh, normally uh, when you access these systems, you use something called an SSH, which is a secure shell. So it's like an encrypted way of communicating with some remote system. And yeah, it's encrypted because, you know, since you're talking to a remote system over an open network, you need some way to ensure that your connection with that remote system is secure. And yeah, nobody else can snoop in. So SSH is like a very lightweight way of uh, doing this sort of communication. And if you are a Mac or Linux user, you have a built-in terminal which supports SSH. Uh, but if you are a Windows user, uh, I mean, you can use a Windows PowerShell if you are if you uh, want. Uh, but like the command line. Uh, instructions for PowerShell may differ compared to, you know, what Mac or uh, what Unix or Linux users uh, use. So it's, uh, there's something called PuTTY, which is like a very yeah, straightforward way to get started with. So uh, if you just search for PuTTY, uh, you know, P -U -T -T -Y, uh, uh, you would get, I, I would ex I would uh, recommend a Movax term. <laughs> True, sure, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, even I use Movax term actually. I, it's, I just suggested party because uh, you can get started with it very quickly because you just download something and it's there. Uh, Movax. Uh, so if you check out this web page for Hummingbird, the the link that I shared, so they suggest a couple of Windows clients. So you can use any of them. Uh, as you suggested, mobile term is actually very good because like it stores uh, your passwords for different systems, right? So you don't have to enter your password over and over again. And, you know, it has other features like uh, X11 forwarding. So if you normally these supercomputing systems are uh, what they call CLA, command line interface. Uh, so it's like, uh, you know, there's no graphics involved here. Like you're not interacting with a graphical user interface. It's all about text commands. Uh, but if you have some form of graphics operation, like if you're trying to visualize something, uh, what you try to do is, you know, whatever visualization tool that you're running on your remote machine, you can forward that data to your local system. And you know these uh, smarter uh, clients like Mobile Xterm for Windows users, uh, you know, it has a built-in next level uh, functionality. So yeah, if, uh, you can use either Putty or Mobile Xterm. Uh, we would suggest Mobile Xterm. Uh, yeah, but yeah, whatever you choose, uh, if you install it, uh, you know. Or if you already if you have a Mac, uh, then you can just open up the terminal application. And another thing for Hummingbird, apart from the SSH, is uh, you need uh, the campus VPN client. 
uh, because we are off campus. So uh, we won't be able to access Hummingbird if we are not connected to the VPN. Um, so yeah, this is the link for the VPN client. If you already don't have it, uh, you need to set it up. So uh, it uses your uh, cruise ID and your gold password. And it also uses your uh, the Duo app uh, for a two-factor authentication. Um, so yeah, just to show how it works. So if you use the Cisco thing, uh, this is the uh, VPN ID uh, address. So you just connect to it. You give your And for MFA, you say push. So what it will do is it will send a push notification to your phone uh, here. Then you can just say approve. And yeah, so that establishes your uh, VPN connection. And after that, you can log into uh, Hummingbird. So uh, Andre and... Uh, Andres and Aiden, uh, do you already have uh, these two things? Um, I'm installing it right now. Okay. Yeah, I have the VPN uh, awesome. on my desktop, but uh, yeah, um, any I'm... any terminal app apart from the VPN. Okay. Yeah, because I have I have Linux on my uh, laptop, so I wanted to do it. On, I need to put it on my laptop. Yeah. So you just you know you don't need uh, anything if you have already if you already have Linux, you can just use uh, your terminal application oh okay yeah so uh yeah once you have these two things uh you can just use this command to uh, access so this will be with your cruise id i'll just show an example uh let's do this uh, okay I, i'll show with both with putty uh let's say so you need to enter your the host name or the ip address here the IP address for Hummingbird is hd.ucsc.edu. You keep the port as 22 and you just say open. So it's asked for uh, a login. I'll try to, uh, let's see. So you give your cruise ID and you give your um, gold password again. And yeah, you are connected. I'll increase the font for this. So yeah, once you enter your uh, yeah the ID and password, uh, this is how Hummingbird looks like. It, it's some um, yeah default message, and at the end you get something like this. Um, So this is like the prompt which suggests that, okay, it's a successful login. Uh, yeah. So like, yeah, uh, let's take that we have enough time. So uh, what I want to do in this session is ensure that all of you can connect to Hummingbird. Um, so if you have any, if you're facing any installation issues, if you want me to repeat any instructions, uh, we are here for you. Uh, Mark, uh, I think you might already have access to Hummingbird, right? If you did, uh, did you do uh, AM250 or any other course where you accessed uh, one of the UC Santa Cruz clusters? Ah, awesome. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's this is how it looks like. And yeah, as I said, uh, unfortunately, Hummingbird is down. 
uh, for the winter break. Uh, but yeah, we'll try our best to get uh, access to some other uh, supercomputing cluster. Like Scott recently told us that uh, he got us an allocation on one of um, uh, the largest supercomputing clusters in the United States. So that's a part of uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, NERSC, NERSC. And he, he's got enough uh, some compute art there. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'll ask him if we can get accounts for everyone there. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is how it looks like once you are able to access something good. And yeah, since this is a, a Linux based uh, environment, uh, you need to be familiar with some basic commands that you need you know to navigate uh, these systems uh, i think i'll try to do with one of those systems that uh, scott has gotten us access to Yeah, so this is another cluster. This is the cluster that I was talking. Like this is uh, an older system in that cluster, uh, in that uh, in that supercomputing center. Uh, so this is called Pori, T O R I. Uh, so we can use this one, uh, or so this one is like CPU, uh, and it has it has a very old Intel CPU. Uh, the Haswell series, so that's pretty old. Haswell was like 2014, if I'm not wrong, 2014, 2013 time frame. Um, yeah, so almost 10 years now. But it's uh, it like there are a lot of uh, nodes there. So yeah. So in the meantime. Uh, yeah, just tell, just you know, interrupt and just uh, shout out whenever you've gotten access to uh, Hummingbird. And in the meantime, let's talk about like you know how a super. What are the components of a supercomputing system? So let's say. Uh, um. Yeah, if you uh, if you remember from the uh, intro session that we had in October, like this is how it looks like. It's just a rack. So this is a rack, and then there are multiple racks over and over again in a data center. Each rack has multiple systems in it. Let's see if there's a better image. Yeah, like this. So. There are multiple systems in a rack. Actually, is this more better? Yeah, this seems more modular. So, let's see, can I annotate? Let's try to go back. Yeah. So, like this thing, this entire thing is one rack. Okay. And this thing, is one node. So a node is like, uh, you know, it's like the basic building block. Like obviously it will have some components inside, but from a, a compute perspective, from a, from a software perspective, that's like, uh, that's something, uh, that's the basic basic unit. You use multiple such units to run uh, a supercomputing uh, job uh, or a workload. Okay, so like yeah, you have this is one node. All of 
individually they're all they're all one node, a single node but then when the idea behind uh, modern supercomputing clusters is you have hundreds and thousands of such nodes which are connected over a high speed network a high speed interconnect and you know the cables that you are seeing here at the top you know all these green cables and that's basically the uh, interconnect uh, that's those are the cables that are used to connect these nodes with each other and yeah uh, that's one thing that's 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 you know i'll try to come up with some slides to better uh, you know to, yeah to uh, sort of have these uh, things have these definitions in a more textual and uh, well defined format but like yeah right now the terminology is like a node so when whenever we say node that's like the basic thing that um yeah that's one system, one one system one node and whenever the i for these competitions the things that we have to do is we have to uh, so if we look at the description right like can i this oh. ah, okay so a uh, quick question yeah the uh putty because it yeah i wasn't sure how to do it on linux i think it'll take me a little bit longer to figure, oh, figure out how to do uh, that uh just just do control like if you have uh, ubuntu right just yeah. run the terminal uh -huh. do, I, do i need to install the vpn client though because yeah that yeah. one that that's it's um oh yeah i'm not too sure on how to do that one because it's uh using like a tar file and um and it's asking about uh nft or when i have to look at it again okay yeah, so i was i was figuring i, I just do the um uh, just use my windows uh okay sure yeah, cause, um, so what what sort of uh, what question do you have for that? oh yeah for putty um uh -huh. what am i gonna be putting for for host name is gonna be my uh, cruise id uh no host name is hb dot uh, dot edu i'll type it out in the chat All right. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the competition. So these are our tasks. So, uh, in case you haven't checked out this web page for the competition for this for the IHC competition, uh, the Winter Classic is going to be similar to this. Like, uh, applications will be different, systems will be different, but the core idea is similar. We we'll, both competitions involve virtually accessing some supercomputing cluster. So, for IHC, we have access to these three types of these three clusters. We will get access to these three clusters. Uh, for the winter class, it will be something similar. So uh, yeah, we are supposed to run uh, some applications. Uh, why uh, the reason I am going is just to show the task uh, description of what the problem statement of what we are supposed to attempt in these competitions. So let's see. So for this one, the tasks are uh, profile the application. Okay, then run the application on two systems, on the two supercomputing clusters that we have access to. Uh, he's just, they're just saying run, they're not giving. Okay, let's choose another application. Hmm. Okay. Mm, okay, 
let's see I, i'll go to uh, maybe they are updating the uh, task description since the competition has not started yet but i'll go to last year's isc and the tasks we had then so this was a different application and our tasks were let's see yeah so profile sorry so we had to run a task on four nodes uh, on two types of supercomputing centers uh, we had to use all the cores in the node site so we'll talk about what what a core is uh, so that was profiling then we had to give a performance number like the best uh, the essentially the fastest run time on four nodes okay and there was a yeah there was a bonus task uh, of scalability so yeah you had to run uh, the application on one node on two nodes on four nodes and eight nodes and show uh, like so the idea here is uh, the idea behind super any uh, running anything on super computing systems is you can when you have when you are trying to solve a problem by throwing more computational power at it you can achieve two things so you if you have the if the problem set if the problem size is defined and fixed okay so if you are using if you are doubling the amount of compute that you are throwing at it so ideally speaking uh, you should be able to successfully solve the problem in half the amount of time right that's a typical ratio uh, thing uh, a, a simple mathematical ratio so if 10 workers can uh, you know build a, a house in whatever 100 days 20 workers should be able to build that house in 50 days right uh, if it's a very simple mathematical relation between the number of workers and the task at hand so that's one thing so the idea here in the scaling study is to say that okay if the, since the task the problem size is well defined we need to target uh, some a, a, a linear scaling so if let's say the run uh, on one node the run takes let's say uh, two hours okay so on two nodes it should take one hour on four nodes it should take 30 minutes and on eight nodes it should take 15 minutes ideally speaking like that should be what our target is so here the problem size is defined you're just trying to solve it faster by throwing more compute at it so that's one way of utilizing supercomputing clusters the other way is as your amount of compute increases your problem size also increases but you are able to solve larger problems by throwing more compute in the same amount of time so yeah the other analogy here is let's say you are building uh, you know a, a one bedroom house uh, 10 workers can build a one bedroom house in uh, 100 days 20 workers should be able to build a two bedroom house assuming you know double the area uh, whatever double everything a two bedroom house in 100 days because you have twice the number of workers and twice the size of the problem so your time should be constant so keeping one thing constant which is either the problem size or the time throwing more compute allows you to you know uh, do things uh, scale and do things faster or attempt larger problems so here in these competitions we normally deal with the first type of scaling where the problem size is fixed and by throwing more by using more compute by using more nodes the nodes that we saw here so instead of using just one if we use four of them or eight of them we can solve the problem faster and like yeah that's typically that was uh, one of the tasks uh, last year and it will be this is something like yeah you should expect in both competitions there will be a scaling yeah there will be a scalability 
uh, exercise. And yeah, uh, that's one idea. So yeah, the basic building block is a node. You combine multiple nodes and use parallel programming to ensure that you know the problem size that you have is divided you know based on the number of nodes that you have and so you use parallel programming for a couple of things right you use it to divide the problem and distribute it amongst all you know all the nodes all the worker nodes that you have you also use it for the workers to interact with each other so the idea is that if whatever problem size that you have as each worker uh, let's see if i try to use a code or something uh, try to use this cell. so like yeah if this is your entire problem size we'll call it ps if you have uh, one node working on it okay that's straightforward right like one node uh, so it it has to target everything here but if you have two nodes you would ideally try to do like you could, you could try to divide the problem in this way that half of it goes here and half of it goes here so from from the reference point of a single node it has it is doing like half the amount of uh it is trying to solve half the amount of the problem and yeah uh that's there but it's not just uh it's not an isolated sort of thing like it's not just that the problem is divided and that's all like i mean that that can happen in a very um if if your problem size is lot of simple if the problem what you're trying to solve is pretty simple then you can just say okay you do half you do half and at the end uh once you know once both nodes have solved the problem you just combine the results and you know check whether something is successfully done or uh access denied on the login okay hmm. yeah i checked uh, check the password made sure i was i was putting the right one copied and pasted it and yeah it's still not okay just a moment hmm. this did anybody else try to access hummingbird and are they seeing any issues like these um i got the vpn up and then i don't know what to do after that so uh once uh, are you using a mac or windows yeah i'm on mac so you have your terminal application mm -hmm. so if if i and you're connected to the vpn yes okay so Oh yeah, is it cruise blue or cruise gold? I'm pretty sure I have a. Um, I, I use cruise gold. The password that you use to like log into my dot ucsc. Mm. Yeah, that, that's the one I use. Like, uh, I, yeah, I tried putting in that line this one with my cruise ID, and that it said there was no directory found. But did it log in after that? No, it said that they didn't have a directory. uh what does it show after that like did it just stop yeah it looks set what's cruise blue uh that's the other password that you have uh, where do you use it i think you use it for accessing systems on like in the library that's where you use it mm. or to access your uh, like soe account something i could try with that mm -hmm. okay oh but yes no yeah this is about logging into the system like 
we should be able to log in. Uh, Yue, how about you? Uh, have you logged into Hummingbird before? If not, can you try now? Um, I've already logged in. Okay, no problem. Mm. This further instructions about what to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Hummingbird uses cruise ID and cold password. Uh, could you try? This one, in case uh, you just add a minus L uh, between SSH and the cruise ID thing. Yeah. SSH minus L cruise ID space mm -hmm. HP dot ECH Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, I got in. Oh, okay, awesome. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Andres, could you repeat? Uh, okay, access denied, right? Um, I have uh, my gold, and I'm using my gold password. And I have uh, mm -hmm. my buddy set up to hp.ucsc.edu. Um, yeah. might have, I might look for my blue password, try that, I guess. Uh, okay, but in the meantime, uh, I'll just show how, uh, you know, uh, the Cori Supercomputing Center looks like. So, yeah, a uh, couple of terms that I'm throwing here. So right now, uh, where I've logged in, is called uh, a login node. So, Cori. Yeah, so from the outside, Cori looks like this. 
it's a cray system cray uh, if you all might have heard uh, cray was like the founder of hpc system supercomputers uh, same or cray one of the first uh, yeah people who designed a large supercomputer and then started a company as well and right now cray has been so cray was acquired by hewlett packard enterprise a couple of years back but like yeah it's still the the name is still pretty uh how the lot of weight behind it so this is a uh, an intel based system so normally as you see uh, the even for these competitions or anywhere in the world you will there will be some uh set of nodes in the system which are like homogeneous and yeah uh that's typically a way like that's how you characterize so these programming systems are owned by national labs and the way national labs try to you know form these systems is like you have a large system of a homogeneous set of nodes so that and you know and you have a different system like so this is intel uh, another national lab may have uh, you know all amd based systems that's another hardware manufacturer another lab may have a, a gpu based uh, system a uh, supercomputing system uh, in either designed by nvidia another may have amd gpus but you know there'll be hundreds and thousands of these nodes of a similar configuration and the idea behind national labs is like you know you have these large centers everywhere and you try to find out like whatever problem that you are trying to solve which type of system suits you and your workloads and in a way our competition is at least the ifc one where you have access to multiple you know types of system like for the isc one uh, we have uh, bridges to uh, fau uh, yeah we have this uh, fau supercomputer bridges to supercomputer and hpc uh, hpc ai uh, supercomputer the, these three types these three have different configuration uh, if i remember correctly yeah pittsburgh uh, bridges to is amd based systems uh, this one uh, the fau has both intel and gpu nodes and hpc is, uh, ai uh, are intel based systems but they also have something called a dpu uh we can talk about it later but like it's another type of uh, network accelerator but like yeah the idea here is that you are given a problem uh, you like you are given actually three applications the three problems and you have to analyze that application and try to see which type of system like whether a cpu only system is good for it uh, if it's a cpu if cpu is them the good for it then which type so each of these systems will have something different right not just the cpu like the cpu vendor or the gpu vendor but also like the amount of memory nodes have what type of network is being used uh, to connect you know multiple nodes together and at a larger scale also uh, what is the topology of the network that is used to connect these nodes together so like there are multiple variables and the many some of these things can be tuned by you as a user some of these things are you know well defined for whatever supercomputing system there is but like yeah uh, you can have different vendors different configuration so on and so forth so uh, with that aspect uh, cori is an intel based system so there are 20 login nodes because there are probably 100 so uh, just to give an idea why you, do you need so many login nodes login nodes are the ones that we directly interact with they where we as a user ssh to where we log into and where we run our commands so this is one of the login nodes i am on 408 and this is a command which we use to show the queue of jobs uh, like the work the jobs that have been put in a queue to be run on the system 
So once I run this, then yeah, these many jobs are there in the queue. And like, you know, there are probably hundreds of users who are, so on this login node, there are these many users who are currently logged in, you know, probably whatever, 50 users at least. So, and there are 20 such nodes. So if, uh, probably, and this is like close to vacation time. So if right now there are about a thousand users, uh, imagine what may be happening during peak time. So like, yeah, if you, the idea of a login node is since you have so many people trying to access these systems at a single time, a single system cannot handle this much workload without you know, making it slow for everyone else. So you need multiple uh, systems to handle you know, user interaction. So that's a login node. That's only for user interaction. Then you have something called a compute nodes. So the idea behind supercomputing systems is you, as a user, you log into the login node, you run some commands, uh, and that's where a scheduler comes into the picture. That's what was the one of the topics to be covered in uh, today's session. So, yeah, some there's some there's a software running in the background called the scheduler, which uh, takes care of of you know running your jobs and running the jobs of other hundreds and thousands of users. So let's say, uh, let's take the five of us, right? So let's say uh, Aiden wants to run, uh, we have, let's say uh, you see the Hummingbird system has 20 nodes and Aiden requests four of them, uh, UA requests 10 of them, Andres requests four of them, and Mark and I are uh, just getting started. So we just need one node each. So uh, one, basic way of doing it is let's say there are 20 nodes and if i am the administrator i say nodes numbered uh, you know one to uh, one to whatever six are given to aiden uh, seven to whatever uh, 16 are given to ua and you know so on and so forth like i manually decide which nodes should be allocated to which user and that's a very naive way of doing it because your requirements, your compute requirements are not fixed. And so like right now you may be wanting four nodes, but once you, if, what if you want to run, you know, more, what, what if you want more number of nodes in some, in the future? And I'll have to be involved every time. I'll have to see, oh, is UA not using some nodes? Why not, why don't I? you know, give some notes to Aiden. It's a very manual uh, uh, and cumbersome way of doing this. Or uh, another thing is I have to be active. As, as a human, I have to monitor everything and and you have to tell me about your requirements and I have to see, check, and do those things. So that's a very naive way of doing it. So what people said, why don't we use a software to do this? So there's something called a scheduler running in the background which takes care of all the nodes. It has a live view of which nodes, which compute nodes are free. So compute nodes are essentially uh, what I was showing in the picture. It's like, you know, the workhorse of your uh, supercomputing system. Like this is all, this is what is designed to run all of your computations. That's a compute node. So. Like if you have, uh, so the software takes care, uh, has a has an idea of, okay, you know, which compute nodes are free, which compute nodes are busy, which user is running jobs on which compute nodes. It has a mapping, it has a queue, everything. And instead of allocating nodes in a way that, you know, it's fixed, it's not a fixed allocation, it's a job-based allocation. So let's say Aiden starts a job. Aiden is first in the queue, he starts a job. And, you know, let's say he asks for four nodes. So the scheduler software sees that, okay, nodes are free. Let's give Aiden four nodes and Aiden's uh, job start. And let's say it takes two hours. So uh, sometime in the middle, let's say UA logs in and she wants some nodes. And let's say out of the hundred nodes, she's asking for 19 nodes. 
and yeah 90 nodes are free so the scheduler says okay checks that 90 nodes are free gives you a 90 nodes and so right now ua's job uh, job is running which is 90 nodes aiden's job is running which is like four nodes and there are six nodes free okay now let's say andres uh, says he wants to run a job and he needs 10 nodes but you know 10 nodes are not available so the scheduler will there's a queue okay there's a, so since there's a queue the scheduler will say okay and andres uh, let's queue your job requirement here so uh, once you are in the queue uh, you have like a, an order right so since you have launched your job after ua you are number 3 in the queue but since the number of nodes are not uh, you know are less than the number of nodes that you need a number of nodes that are free are less than the number of nodes that you need uh, we will not the scheduler will not start will not launch your job but will keep it in the queue let's say after andres has requested some nodes uh, mark says i just want to uh, run my job on two nodes uh, why don't i uh, uh, what like why don't i start my job so the scheduler looks at it scheduler sees that mark's request is fourth in the queue but mark only needs two nodes and you know more than two nodes are available so the scheduler can have this sort of policy that okay mark uh, there are some nodes available for mark uh, why don't we start mark's uh, job and like yeah so essentially there's this sort of queuing thing and like, let's say aiden's job gets done with and uh let's say i'm number 5 uh and you know i need just eight nodes uh and there may be a lot more than eight nodes but you know andres was first in the queue and once the nodes are free he will be uh you know given the first crack uh, like his jobs will be launched first so yeah uh that's the idea that's like a very rough idea behind the scheduler it's like a software taking care of the queues based on when users submit their jobs and now of course uh, there will be some more intricacies there based on like you could assign priorities to different users to uh, you can assign priorities based on the estimated runtime of your job so on and so forth let's not jump into that there but right now just envision it as a queue so cori as a system has uh, what i was talking about was racks uh, like in this picture right so th i was calling this a rack so you can also call it a cabinet i think yeah a cabinet uh, is one rack if i'm not wrong could be two racks uh, but like whatever it's like a set of nodes so uh, cori has 14 rack cabinets of this thing and you know that comprises of more than 2000 nodes and uh, so this is an intel processor from as I said, about 10 years back. And this is another Intel processor called Neat Landing. Uh, just the name is fine. This is now discontinued. Uh, but like, yeah, it was a, it was supposed to be a powerful accelerator uh, sort of chip. It's and, a Phi, uh, Intel Phi. Yeah. So yeah. basically it's a uh, AVX 512 accelerator that to used to compute with compete with the nvidia ssimt model but uh they couldn't find a way to balance the price and the uh, something so i think the phi is out of the commercial available market so gpu wins phi actually there's a lot of fine-tuned um practice back then like in 2016 there's some fine-tuned works on phi for yeah. uh nwcam for quantum espresso something like that but now they are integrated into the avx 512 extension into one cpu yeah. you know, into a amd cpu and the uh, intel cpu so for fourth gen um maybe we will use in in isc competition it was equipped with the avx 512 uh, although it's not compatible with um uh, with some of the loading bandwidth of uh, intel but uh, you still need to be aware of that we can like look into the prior work on the phi to find to our our um, code into into avx 512 to different vendors yeah yeah um yeah so this special type of chip they're like 
close to 10,000 of these nodes. So you can imagine the scale of this supercomputing system. And like, yeah, to handle so many nodes and so many thousands of users, yeah, you need uh, these many login nodes. But like, yeah, that's yeah. the idea. Um, actually, there's also the scheduler for logging nodes. So once you log in actually into hb.ucsd.edu, you can inspect that maybe there's a different logging node you are logging to. So you have to be aware of, um, if you're running something on the logging node, you are aware that you are on the same logging node prior to your previous to want to see the work. Actually, if you want to like team up something and compile something on the logging node, you need to be aware of that. So actually, it's very similar if you want to, uh, if you know something like the web server. So there's a CDN back end. So the front end is basically to DNS resolve um, like hb.ucsc.edu and they will distribute it as a, each one, one of them will be assigned to you and uh, you will like schedule your logging node on it. So actually Slum has two different type of um, say one is management node, the other are compute node and compute node can be configured as a CPU node and GPU node. So you can type in some like S info and S batch to, to see that and you can schedule on them. And you, you, you have to know that the, you are on the same login, although for S batch in terms of view, in terms of view, you get the same result, but many of the cases that we compile our binary on the logging node, because then normally the logging node architecture is as similar or the same as the uh, compute node. So that if you compiling on the logging node will save you a lot of uh, time course. So the time, time course may be the limits of the supercluster competition are limiting you. Yeah, so that's what I'm adding to Neil's talk. And yeah, you can see that of the like Islam script. Uh, it's basically very similar to to the to the bash, but um, there's a macro in. Could you cut the semantic I sh? I think it's uh. Yeah. So basically, like it's how you tell the scheduler how much cores, how much node you want to schedule on. And normally the slum has a wrapper for MPI that your node, they automatically has some um, pass variables onto every node for you. Like if you want to schedule one node 40 cores, like normally you need to run MPI hyphen MP 40 and hyphen MPP node per core, uh, node per machine for one. But these are like passed using S batch um, as a pass parameter if you're purely using S run. So S run is a, a slum wrapped MPI. So, um, and also you have to specify your time wall. That is uh, the hard limit of your code running time. So also there's um, like some constraints, like how, which queue, so they have the multiple queues like CPU nodes, GPU nodes, or different CPU nodes. So I have to know that. Um, and sometimes it has the QoS for debugging. So how QoS is quality of a control, quality of a service that um, for debugging, it will like give you a lower end machine. So sometimes if you are given the superclass competition, you have to first scan like using the S batch to know um, which well, how much range is what CPU? And you will know that you can find your uh, requiring the best performance to the best CPU and GPU. Sometimes they have some difference for the single cluster because um, because of uh, maybe they further added something. Um, my prior experience at the at the Niagara, like in IC twenty two, like after GL one thousand named. Um, it will be Cascade's third gen. So before 1000 is the third, like the um, the first gen or the second gen. So I, I think that's some of the hack of uh, S batch. Yeah. So that's all I want to add. 
So uh, also SLM has actually some some um, past condition that you can tune. Like here is the SLM submit DIR. So in the directory that you are submitting, it will be a past past condition you can pass to. So for because um, your schedule on the node that like share the file system with you, but don't has the same uh, same pass condition with. You. So you need first to CD that um, submit directory, maybe using the maybe using the pass condition that in your um, using the slum pass condition, or you can um, some something like adding more LD library pass or um, pass because sometimes if your pass are not in coordinated with your logging node, you, the the file system in the remote or the, your scheduled node will not know that where's your pass in. So um, that's very similar to, to batch actually. So you need to know that you you use this batch to run on the new C, a new node and there's no pass condition on it. You have to pre-configure it um, every time so automatically you bring up your node. Yeah. Or you have something called uh, modules for uh, for pre-installed software yeah, that you want I, to use. I think we should use spec. So spec is a LB uh, LLNL. Uh, so who who invent who just um, invented a nuclear bomb a uh, nuclear plant uh, like yeah. last week. So yeah. that um that national lab actually provided a lot of useful tools for HPC management. So like Singularity is a um, Docker that is used for a uh, better environment management. So you can like Dockerize every environment you want. And also spec is used to like similar to module, but there's no need for you to hand written like the module like bash for configuration. The only thing you want to um, run is Python and, and the Python is to use to automatically configure a uh, make file for each project. And um, you can use this Python script to run on any machine and and um, and install it with the best configured software. So if you want to uh, like configure quantum espresso, for example, like you write a Python script for installing like you have to configure which compiler, which options do it. And on another machine, like for our competition machine, you can also use the same spec um, script to do to run on it. And after installing, you can use spec to load it or a module to load it. So it's very useful. Uh, yeah, it's called spec. Uh, yeah, so what you really was talking about here is batch and everything, right? So that's the scheduler uh, sort of commands that we give like uh, to to the scheduler as to like, you know, how many nodes do we need uh, in a particular node? How many uh, tasks do you want to run? How much time do you need for your job? Any other, you know, and some other constraints which are typically specific to that supercomputing center and, you know, which will be available on the documentation for that supercomputing center. But like, yeah, these are present in every submit script uh, that you use uh, on the login node. So whatever, uh, you know, this will be there always at the start and whatever else after that, uh, you know, other commands that you want, you know, you'll put after that, you know, which involves like, you know, loading a particular pre-installed software uh, and then using some build, something that you have built earlier, using that to run some job, so on and so forth. And if you have any other post-processing tasks after it, so that will all be below here. But what I wanted to show with this sample script is, it's a very small thing. So I've written, uh, something called system info, which is, I'm just running uh, something called host name. Uh, it's a Linux command, which gives you the name of the node that you're on. 
So it's so, best, it's basically cutting the etc slash uh, host. So yeah. you configure it every it's only one machine. So first you have to configure your host name. Yeah. So that host name is a user defined name. Uh, it's like a proper noun which the admins decided for uh, the system. So right now I'm on uh, a login node, and when I run it, it says I'm on Cori zero eight, and this is the output uh, that I generated when I, so th with the submit script, what I'm saying is essentially run this uh, host name on one of the uh, nodes, one of the compute nodes. That's what the submit script is. And when I run that, the output is generated here and it says, okay, it just, as you see, it has a different name. So it essentially ran host name, the command host name on one of the compute modes. Um, so I want to add something. So every node actually has a multiple IP address and you can find multiple uh, multiple host name to different NICs. For example, in a Ethernet network space, it's like 192.168.1.1 or dot two. So actually you can cut those all like on the logging node through etc slash hosts to know um, the all the possible connected hosts to logging to like normally the management port or uh, Ethernet like normally ETH zero ETH one or something and we also have infinite band which is starts with IP zero and if it's uh infinite band over Ethernet it will be a uh, IBS zero P one or something um there will be a sign up a uh, port and um. Uh, so it, it was just connected the same as the TCP, but uh, IB0 is uh, specified for uh, using a different driver to kernel bypass things for, for, different, for, for, for its own configured library. Um, normally we use the HPCX. So um, and we'll talk about it later, but um, so the difference here is normally IB is not exposed to the logging node because, lo uh, because the scheduler only used the management port to control the following CPU and GPU nodes. And sometimes only the GPU nodes are connected. And you need to know the topology of your SLARM scheduled node. Like if you know that your host name are um, numberly, like decreasingly chronologically, like close, you, you know that um, they're like recise in the, same rack is like very possibly uh, because every time we, we don't we don't want to our like in the same rack like to schedule on a different racks because if you're uh, fine to different racks you will go through the top of the rack switch which is called tor switch there was super congestion for communication so sometimes we use a scan not only first to see the host name but also we need to like ping different nodes to know whether they're in the same rack, like both the IB and the Ethernet. Yeah. So that's some hack in, inside the SLARM because um, SLARM is, is uh, configured mostly for co economy that um, some of our forms of our vacant, you will be assigned to, but maybe there will be Farthest, like a, inside the data center. Yeah, so you need to make it recite. Oh, so Nail has shown that the, the all nodes that will be configured for different um, tasks. So you know that some of the NID are scheduled to use with uh, one and others are idle. So yeah, so, um, so with the practices is uh, first you use the, uh, Nick to test the latency um, using IB or something or file system or something. And then you can affine using the SLARM script. So you can actually affine four nodes if you want, like here is an ID, like the, the last um, 00485 to 00501 is vacant. So that 16 node, you can affine your job onto it. That's like in great possibility that they are they resize each other and you get the greatest topology.
Um, yeah, so as you saw in a, in a typical supercomputing super center, you have these many number of nodes. And when you have these many number of nodes, the network that is there to connect these nodes can become very complex. And yeah, as you were telling about you know, the intricacies behind launching jobs, like the scheduler is not, may not be so smart that it gives you the best possible, the scheduler need not always give you the best possible list of nodes to run your job on. Uh, you may have to do some trial and error and try to figure out, you know, am I getting the best possible set of nodes? It's a very trial and error sort of thing, but yeah, that's the that's the competition, that's the task. Uh, yeah, so the idea, so we have given you, uh, we've given you actually a lot of terms, uh, you know, login nodes, compute nodes, management nodes. Slurm. So yeah, scheduler. Slurm is one scheduler. Okay, that's S L U R M. Slurm. That's one type of scheduler. There's another called PBS. Uh, yeah, that may also be. So it's a very, it's a choice. Every supercomputing center has makes their own choices. They both have their pros and cons. Uh, it's up to the admins and the users and the owners who decide. Uh, okay, we need a particular type of uh, scheduler. And the thing is, the each scheduler has its own set of commands, uh, but there is a mapping. Uh, so, like, if you want to see the queue of jobs, yeah. So to see like the jobs, uh, the the queue that you're talking about, let's learn. You can see that with S Q, and when you do that. It just gives you all the jobs that have been uh, queued. And so, like, so many jobs are in the queue, and this is their uh, job ID. So, as you can see, like, more or less, it's in some sort of order. And, like, you know, uh, you can see uh, they are running. So, job, this job 6517546 is running uh, on this node. Then the next started on some other node and you know if it's a single node thing uh, it's running only on one node okay so it can be allocated randomly there's no order where like, there's no predefined orders like 549 554 556 510 520 like you know whatever is free let's see if there are any multi node jobs uh, resources i think these are all resources i don't see any multi-node jobs, right? But like, you see, I've scrolled so much. There are so many jobs in the queue. And like, yeah, for now, it seems uh, everything is a uh, single node. But like, yeah, uh, that's what the, this, this gives you a queue. And uh, there's something called uh, so S batch is what you use to submit jobs. So I, I'll put all of this in the slides for your friends and you will also be able to access these commands on the web on the documentation of the cluster but right now i'm just giving something so that you know it sticks in your brain because when you are actually running experiments on these clusters you will be using these commands so sq s batch is something that you use to submit a job so like let's say so that this is the sample submit script that i wrote right uh, submit.sh and the way you can identify it's designed for uh, Slurm schedulers is by these starting commands. So at batch, at batch, at batch, whatever, how many nodes I need, how much time constraints, so on and so forth. So to run this thing, I'll just say at batch submit.sh, whatever is the name of that submit script. And it'll take some time, it'll say submitted batch job, blah, blah, blah. And if I, let's see, let's try to rerun SQ. Let's see if our job is in the picture. Uh, yeah. Finding it is going to be a hassle. So I'll do one thing. You can always try to, you know, oh, another thing is mine is a very slow, uh, fast running job. So it's already finished. The way we can see it's finished is it has created an output file. So it's a very fast running job. 
I'll try to see, I'll try to change this and ensure, see that if it can stay for some time so that we can check it out. Uh, sleep, let's say 5,000. Yeah, essentially I'm just putting a sleep. So two, four, eight, four, six, five, right? Let's see. You. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we can see it here. When I, I, I so I said that from SQ only show jobs which belong to my user ID. Uh, that's with this command. And okay, it showed that okay, this is the job. And yeah, it's it's launched on this node. And yeah, that's a, that's how. And you can just do something like what, and it just shows you like a periodic update of the job running every two seconds. Essentially, what what is doing is it it is running this command sq over and over again every two seconds. But like yeah, this is just one way to monitor running jobs. Uh, okay, that was s batch sq. Uh, there's also something called S info, which is information about the different types of nodes or partitions in your system. Now, if I run S info on the Scory system, since there are so many types of nodes and so many types of partitions, you will get a lot of info, which may not be, you may not be able to appreciate with the command right now, but I'll run it on Hummingbird instead. And you'll get to understand a little bit here. So Hummingbird is a slightly, it's a smaller system. So it is a bit more easier to understand relatively. So, okay, so Hummingbird has, let's see, four types of partitions. So you have something like this, which I think is, I think 256 is, if we go to the web page, it'll tell you about the partitions. Instructional views, no, creating scripts to run jobs, I think. Um, that. Maybe getting started. Yeah. There are four public partitions, also called queues. Uh, okay, they haven't described that. But I, if I'm not wrong, this may be the RAM size. So this may be like 128 GB RAM per node. And 24 may be like the number of compute, the number of cores per node. So like this is their nomenclature of defining a partition and giving you an option of saying that, okay, I want to launch my job only on nodes which have this particular configuration because each node has 24 cores and 128 GB RAM. Or you want to launch it on a GPU node which has four GPU per node. Or you want to launch it on a node which has something like this, uh, 44 cores per node and 256 GB RAM. So like this is, a uh, S info gives you that idea. It uh, it gives you two, three sort of things. One is the types of, these are logical partitions that the admins have created. By logical, I mean like it's a way of segregating system into some sort of groups. The, you, all your nodes in your system in some sort of groups based on some common configuration. And that's what is the partition. There's also, S info also gives you an idea about uh, what, how many nodes are there per partition and what is their status? So like right now, as we saw that this cluster is down, it's all in drain mode. What drain is drained. So like the nodes are sort of, they are on, but they're not available for people to use. Like that's one way of looking at drain. So yeah, and this is like the, the host names of the nodes which belong to these partitions. So similarly, if we go back to Cori, uh, yeah, let's look at this. So there's one partition called real-time shared, uh, which has 
1789 nodes in this partition which are allocated to some job these are all the host names of those 1789 nodes in a similar way there's another called benchmark which has what 11172 nodes which are allocated and these are all the nodes so like s info gives you this sort of idea it may not be very helpful in such a large system uh but like you know you never know uh it's it's a good tool to have in your cache so right now you can uh keep these three commands in mind uh, another thing would be s cancel so let's go back to the job that we had launched so it's still running but the thing is uh, i had placed at the command that it is running is sleep what sleep says is just uh, don't do anything just run a uh, just run a background process which just sleeps so the in the initial uh, submit a script i had uh, said that the job should run for 10 minutes so this is the thing r is minute second so i said run for 10 minutes and if i if i decide that okay i don't want to let the job run to till the end i want to cancel the job i can use something called s cancel and after s cancel i give the job id so if we go back to sq from a running state it is in something called cg where it is just completing uh, doing the last final some uh, task before giving up the node so there there's always so whenever you are allocated a node and whenever you once your job is done when you relinquish the node there is going to be some housekeeping tasks which are run by the scheduler and cg sort of demonstrates that that if you if something is running on your node and you forcibly cancel it or it runs out of time it will run some task and let's see if it is done so yeah that job was cancelled and it is no longer running so yeah there are these the four commands the four scheduler commands that we talked about today uh hopefully uh, we we'll get access we will get you access to cori or some other system where you will be able to practice with these commands uh and you know play around with them but i i'll also try to put it in slides so that you can use it for future reference but like yeah i think this is what i wanted to cover sort of just give you a brief idea uh un yeah unfortunately i didn't check beforehand that hummingbird was going to be operational so my bad uh but i'll try to get you access on some other system uh i think yeah we've crossed more than an hour so uh, let's not go for more time maybe we'll do it something in the coming week so if you have any doubts maybe we can talk about it for some time now uh, so yeah go ahead with your question uh if not uh yeah and uh, i had just one question for everyone is have you like were you able to get access to hummingbird i remember andres you were facing some issue so would it that get resolved or uh, are you still facing that issue with hummingbird yeah I still have issues okay um, yeah i i put in a ticket awesome um, okay so yeah cuz yeah. i then i i tried going on back to my um on my laptop for linux and then uh yeah now and then on that one now my gold isn't working for uh the vpn so um okay yeah, i i put in a ticket though hopefully they'll they're they can get back to me soon sure i don't i don't know if they're busy <laughs> yeah uh, this is sort of a bad time for these logistic support but yeah okay uh, so if there are no other questions yeah we can stop for now uh, i'll try to see where this recording can be put up i'm stopping the recording now